this is the first mention of the image of God. Oops. Genesis 1. Let the I'll just start at verse 24. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fish of the sea uh, and the birds of the air and over the cattle over all the earth and over all the creeping things. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So I guess before we go on to another verse, I just, any thoughts about, I know we, there's been a lot of conversation about what, who the plural is here and that all thing, but what, what, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? And I think there's been a lot of ink spilled on this, but uh, what do you guys, Ooh, what do you man, yeah. Here? Starting out there makes me wish we had Sherman with us just for just for a second. Um, there there has been a lot of controversy surrounding the us and we um, or our image, the us language that's in verse 26. But to, to speak specifically about imaging God, the word for image there as a as a linguistic point, uh, it's worth noting that the word for image in that verse is actually. Uh, the same terminology that's being used uh, to d describe the prohibition that God gives in the second commandment, that we would make no graven image of the Lord or God to put in our temple, right? Um, the, the point of that prohibition is, in fact, this right here, that God had already made those images, and that us being in the temple is God's presence in the temple already, right? Like that that we don't need a statue of stone or of wood or of anything else to stand in to have the presence of Almighty God and heaven on earth. God, in this verse right here, go it's it's uh um go go back one verse. Okay, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, let them have dominion. Dominion is rule. This is a uh, this is an authority language. This is delegation. So we're meant to represent God to creation. We're meant to fulfill a vocation and a role that is bestowed by God with all the implications and endowments that that would require. And that's going to be something that informs our function, our form, and our purpose, and all of the experience that we have that's meaningful in the earth that's going to correspond with this are all going to be the things that have pleasure that don't lie to you the way that like false pleasures do. And you have to keep chasing them and they lead to addictions. This is the kind of real pleasure that's fulfilling and creates memory rather than haunting. Right. Mm -hmm. These are the kind of things that we do that image God. They fulfill us. We know that we experience that it becomes something that's also biological to us because we're embodied. Notice if we if we jump from here, I don't mean to jump too quickly, but if you go from here to chapter two, you get the account of how God made uh, uh, Adam, right? Which is ultimately to say that in the beginning, he formed him of the, right here, there you go, formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. So it wasn't, it wasn't the matter and it wasn't the spirit. It was the combination of the spirit and the matter making a composite creature that was called man. Then it became a living soul, this nefesh, right? That's the image of God, the combination of heaven and earth, the presence of God in matter, which is ultimately, that's what man is meant to be. You're not a, sp a spirit that's trapped in a body, and you're not a body that's haunted by a spirit. You are a spirit man. That's what you are. That's what you're made Wait, I, to be. I, I, I got to ask you, so, so you, you're orthodox, right? Me? Or no. Yeah, yeah. Wait, are you Orthodox? Um, I'm friendly to Orthodox, but no, I'm not. Oh, okay, okay. I was, I was like, <laughs> man. <laughs> <laughs> I was like that. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. That's I. I'm so glad you brought up Dominion, though. I think that gets left out quite a bit. Dominion, I think, is really the key word because God has dominion of all of His creation. Then He gave us a portion of that creation to have dominion over, right? So we act out who He is in His image, like like Him. We need to be like Him. I, I, I'm so glad you brought that up. I think it's overlooked quite a bit. So awesome. 
Yeah, I, I think that to back what Josh said and what you're saying, uh, Dr. Carmen Imes, an Old Testament scholar, and her book, Being God's Image, Why Creation Still Matters, covers the the Hebrew behind that phrase in uh, in his image. And she argues that the syntax for in is actually incorrect. It should be as. So God made us as his image, which ties back with what Josh said about the second commandment, right? The reason why there's a prohibition against making an image to represent God is God already has made one. We are as his image. And the word image there is selim in, in Hebrew. And that is the rest of the scriptures, other than when it's saying it in a positive way, is translated as idol. So if you look at it from that perspective, there's a parallelism between pagan worship to idols or to the gods behind these idols and the making fun of them in the Psalms and in the prophets saying, hey, they don't they don't breathe, they don't smell, they don't taste, they don't see, they can't walk, they don't touch. Why? Because it's not just a contrast between God being the one true God. It's also contrasting that his images actually do walk, taste, touch, <laughs> operate. They are an extension of him. In, in, that, and in we're superior. Way. That makes us superior to the false gods in function and form. Yes. Yes. Yes, we're directly tied, like you said, to both this, both grounded and heavenly, both divine and earthly. It's it's a it's a. That's why it's not just dominion over a certain part; it's dominion over all the works of God's hands. And and, and that means that when we serve another image, uh, instead of us being made in the image, we make an image of ourselves, and we serve that. We're abdicating that dominion to something else. Yes. Right. Right. So well, I, I gotta, I gotta, I'm sorry, I gotta interrupt. I didn't expect to be like, like in consensus with everybody. <laughs> like, I don't know you guys, but like, I'm, just, I'm loving this. I, I don't even need to be here. This is fantastic. Nice to meet you guys. Awesome. Well, it's nice to meet you too, man. Like, uh, yeah. you weren't here for the intros, but I, this is where I, these are, these guys are actually guys that, that joined me for a, a show that I host on Faith Unaltered uh, called Cosmic Corner, where we discuss this all the time. Um, uh, but, but applying it to different things, like um, applying it to like the, how the false gods are a stand-in, and so therefore they are they're disembodied. They lack body the way that we have, and they know that we can influence the world in a way they cannot, and so they require body. How do they implement their will to require to acquire a body? What they would do was exercise their will on a group of individuals and create for themselves a body the same way that we would call it the body of Christ is the assembling together of the saints. This is a false assembly and it's not one in which the people are fed by the Christ. It's one in which the people are fed on by the false, right? And this is a vampiric pattern. And so we did an episode on vampires. Uh, we did the same thing from the opposite direction to talk about zombie motifs, how they eat the body, that they're a leap from the body from within. And this is a human materialistic problem. And, and nice. so that's, a lot of different application from these ideas, to be honest with you, like to 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 open the door by, by by talking about the image of God, I think, informs so many things that perhaps in the Western world we've been in exceedingly neglectful of, let's say, where we we I think I think if you understand the image of God rightly, you can define sin in such a larger sense that the law actually becomes something that is is. Like uh, almost like a. Like a, rough draft, a, like a rough draft description yeah of what it I, means to try to image god in a in a world full of the nations who are ran by false images mm -hmm. the law is the encoded version of how to image god in a world that is inundated with idol with idols and so like it makes yeah. sense to say that if you zoom out from the law the larger law ultimately is to image God, that means that sin is not definitionally a legal infraction. It's actually mm -hmm. to falsely image God mm -hmm. by definition. Oh right. man, yeah, yeah. Like, um, if you don't believe me, I, I I have a couple videos upload it where I'm saying exactly that, but in my own way. I basically say there's no there. You don't need any other commands. All you need is the first commandment. If you get it, the rest falls into place. Like when you love your neighbor as yourself, you love them because they are of the image of God. You were called to love God with everything you have. So you should be able to recognize the image of God in all of his creation and love him. You know, so, so like to hear you say this, I'm like, oh, thank goodness. 
But you're yeah. saying it very differently than what, what I would say. Good stuff, yeah. thanks. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that what you're pointing out right there is that what is the what is the intent of the law? So yes, codified. Here's many different ways the love of God, and because I can't hug directly God, the like show Him love directly. Well, I have His imagers to love. So love your neighbor as yourself. What does it look like? Well, the 400 and some odd bylaws is, well, this is what it looks like to love your neighbor and therefore love God. And that's what Jesus does when he talks about it. What's the greatest commandment? It's an argument that predates Christ, um, well, pre predates his human um, uh, incarnation. Yeah, yeah incarnation. It predates the incarnation where Hillel and Shimei are arguing over what's the greatest commandment. Um, and, you know, both of them agree that it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But they disagreed mm -hmm. on what the second one was because that sets the trajectory of the law. If if it's the Sabbath, which is uh, one of their arguments, then it's obedience to the law that shows love to God. And what Jesus puts his money on is, no, it's love of neighbor because the love of neighbor is the love of God. So he's he's sending two different directions of the law, and he's picking one side of it within the context of the Pharisaical arguments. So yes, love of neighbor is the summing of the law, as Paul puts it in Romans, is that it is so important that we understand that it is not our obedience to rules. It is our love of neighbor, and if we love our neighbor, all those rules come naturally downstream of that love. Amen. That's awesome. I, I never thought of it like this before, but as you're talking, you know, Matthew 25, it, where uh, Jesus uh, separates the sheep from the goats, and he's talking about the things that you've done for them, right? And whatever, mm -hmm. for the least of, of these you've done to me. And it's it's almost like, uh, would that Christians would be as pious as pagans? Because you go into a pagan temple, and the image of, of their God there is is just enshrined with money and food, and yet we have Christians that are, are uh, going homeless and have no food and no clothing. And so the, this image theology is, well, how do we love our God? Well, we do have an image by which we love him. And whoever, whatever you do to the least of these that you've done to me. <laughs> uh, of course, Sean, you're going to start early and making my face leak. Uh, <laughs> yes, Dude, this also exactly. what, what you just said, what you just said, Sean, informs also um, the, the role and quality of the evangelist. If I'm meant to be the presence of God to those who have not God. Yes. That's what the Orthodox say. They say that the the poor person has been placed on earth for the for mercy to be shown to the rich. That when they ask for alms, they're offering you salvation. 